Dear distinguished guests and all participants, uh, the seminar will begin shortly. Please be seated and kindly turn off your mobile phone and set up it into the silent mode throughout the conference. Your cooperation is very appreciated. I have a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, we have the evaluation form by the QR code. Uh, please, please uh, do the evaluation form and, and you can get the souvenir in the front of this room. And may I announce men about the MRA signing ceremony today? Uh, we'll be at the, M the room MR214 at 4 p.m. for MRA signing ceremony. And the next session is the session one for today about Halan cosmetic and nutraceutical science. Our session chair today is Dr. Muhammad Ropan Ning Sulong, and we have five speakers for today. Is uh, His Excellency Isan Oput, Professor Dr. Nasima Hamid, and Ms. Devi Rija Zari, and Ms. Kesini Ketleka. Please, all the participants and distinguished guests are uh, visited. Our Session will be begin shortly. We are very welcome you to the Halan Science Center, uh, our Halan Science Center, Chulalongkorn University. Really welcome and thank you everyone for joining our ha Thailand Halan Assembly 2019 and in the next year or so. The session will begin. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ang Sana Ayuken. I'm a scientist at the Halan Science Center, Chulalongkorn University. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the International Halan Science and Technology Conference. And for this session is the Halal cosmetic and this is the session one Halal cosmetic and new surgical sign. May I invite uh, Dr. Muhammad Ropanning Sulong, senior lecturer, TDCGS Science and Biotechnology, University Selangor, Malaysia, on the stage. Please welcome our Dr. Uh, Muhammad Ropan Ning Sulong for be a session chair for today. And may I invite uh, His Excellence, okay, I will, uh, I will uh, announce you about the topic today first. Uh, we have five topics from the five speakers. First is the strategic ways to implement Halan cosmetic standards in industry from His Excellency Isan Oput. And uh, the second topic is value added ingredients in cosmetic by Prof Professor Dr. Nasima Hamid from Auckland University. And uh, the third topic is overview on Halan's critical point of cosmetic and nutraceutical industry perspective by Ms. Devi Rijasari. And the, the last topic is about Halan science and technology for quality assurance and authentication in cosmetic ingredients by Ms. 
เกสินีเกตเลขา May I invite His Excellency Isan Obut, the Secretary General of CIMIC and OIC, on the stage. And may I invite Professor Dr. Nasima Hamid from Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand, on the stage. And may I invite Ms. Devi Rijasari. She is the founder and expert consultant, DRS Consulta, Indonesia. And may I invite Ms. Kesini Ketleka, PhD candidate, research assistant of the Halan Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, Thailand. And welcome with every speaker for today, for the session one. And please, Dr. Muhammad Ropan Ming Sulong, a session chair, can moderate on stage. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks to the um, uh, Mrs. MC. Um, first of all, uh, um, I do hope that uh, everyone still got um, energetic uh, enough to go through this uh, very important session. After uh, listening to a very um, important uh, lecture presented by Prof. Vinay just now um, on the uh, memorial lectures uh, of uh, Prof. Uh, belated Prof. Yaakob uh, Jekmani. And um, first of all, before I um, invite all the speakers uh, to present their topics today, uh, first of all, um, <coughs> um, I would uh, convey salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and, and very good morning to everyone here. Um, indeed, that I'm so uh, honored and delighted to be appointed as a moderator to chair this session. And thanks to the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. And, and this session is very uh, important session um, pertaining the halal cosmetic. And we do have a mix of very prominent um, figures, scientists, um, such as His Excellency um, Mr. Ehsan and Prof. Um, Dr. Azima. And also we have um, uh, a young a scientist and consultant among us today um, such as uh, Ms. Devi Raji and, uh, and uh, Ms. Farida. And, and I hope that I will be the bridge between these two um, prominent uh, scientists and young scientists. So I'm in the middle. Uh, hopefully I'm not too, <laughs> too old enough to be at the middle, okay? And, and um, uh, this um, topic is quite important because um, halal cosmetic actually is uh, one of the um, uh, segment, halal segment that uh, produce a lot of uh, huge uh, market value in the uh, halal uh, global industry for the halal cosmetic. As reported by research and market um, for the last two years, the uh, halal cosmetic market was um, uh, reached to um, 66 uh, billion USD in 2018. And it is expected to raised up to 94 billions by 2024. And, and of course, this one of the segment that can contribute to the uh, growth of the economy for the uh, red Muslim and non-Muslim countries for the halal cosmetic. Um, before I invite uh, all the speakers, I would like to take this opportunity um, to remind all the speakers that since we have a quite limited time given and, and we have four speakers, so mm -hmm. I would um, uh, give one speaker to talk roughly about 15 minutes. And, and I would ring the first bill when it reached to 10 minutes. Okay? And then when it comes to the last five minutes, so I will ring twice. So hopefully that by this and, and uh, 
you can make your conclusion and then we can uh, move to the other speakers. Otherwise, that we, can, uh, we cannot uh, afford to finish within time given because we have still have other sessions uh, after this one. Okay? So without further uh, ado, I would like to call upon the first speaker for today, His Excellency um, Mr. Ehsan Obut. He's the Secretary General of uh, Standard and Meteorology Institute for Islamic countries, SMIC, and also a Secretary General for OIC. And his topic of um, presentation for this morning, he will be talking on the um, strategic ways of implementing halal cosmetic standards in the industries. So please, uh, Mr. Hassan, the floor is yours now. Uh, it's up to you, maybe you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Honorable guest, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, also, I would like to thank the organizers for this important uh, meeting and giving us to the opportunity <coughs> to present uh, here. Uh, today, I will uh, try to explain halal cosmetic standards of SMIC and then uh, implement. Uh, uh, important of implement halal standards in the cosmetic industry. I will start with the brief introduction of SEMIC technical committees and then we'll give detailed information about the OIC SEMIC for 2018 uh, halal cosmetic standard by explaining important points from the, this guide and then I will conclude my presentations. Uh, as the CIMIC, all the, the standards are uh, uh, developing under the technical committees. Each technical committee has a title, scope, working program, and uh, we have a business plan yearly uh, is uh, developing and uh, approving by the, uh, the council about standardization. And each standards has a s uh, systematic maintenance of the, according to the, our the reg internal regulations. We have uh, 18 committees, one of the mm -hmm. committee for uh, assessment committee, the others starting from halal food to handicraft, uh, newly established two new committees. Uh, till now we have published uh, 12 standards. You can see the what famous standards, OSMIC 1, 2, 3, 4, this is just for halal issues. Uh, SMIC 1 for halal foods is just revised this year, published, fully has changed. It uh, includes uh, all uh, related to uh, preparation and processing, packaging and labeling of the, and mar uh, marking and storage and service of the old halal food. The second one is about halal uh, conflict assessment required for bodies providing halal certification. Uh, is based on international standards. The uh, third one is for the halal accreditation bodies. Some point I can say, uh, only OIC member states can do these activities. Uh, those countries trading with the OIC member countries, in, in, uh, uh, they can do any activi these activities in any countries. Uh, now I'm turning to the halal cosmetic, our topic today. Uh, if when uh, these standards published last year, uh, nearly uh, three, uh, four years, our committee discussed these issues. Na na number of committees, TC2. Uh, according to these uh, related two new standards, we're preparing. One is for the uh, test method for detection per scene in cosmetic products. The other test method detection for ethanol in cosmetic products, but they are in the pipe, pipeline. The standards is, uh, before the standards, the importance why, uh, how we share your issues in, in our standards. All uh, uh, standards are uh, based on the FIC Academy rules, because we have to ask them the all issues, fatwa from the ulama, is uh, based in Jid Jidda, uh, including all mazhab. 
eight mazap is there. Uh, important issues for the general issues, we can see for certification, for accreditation, uh, these all activities should be owned and directed by Muslims. It's forbidden for the non-Muslim to do these two issues, certification and accreditation. Uh, also, the officers, key officers should be Muslim in any activities related to halal. And uh, always remember us, halal is a sovereign issue of the Islam Gumba. Turn back to the cosmetic. Uh, these standards defined uh, basic requirement for halal cosmetic industry, especially. Uh, important point, I can say. Halal cosmetic is a term which complies with the halal concept while also meets all the requirements of standards. Uh, it standards uh, refer to some international standards also. Uh, the general requirements uh, when go to the in this the standards according to the semi four is allowed to use all uh, uh, raw materials and ingredients in compliance with the existing national and or international regulations as long as they meet other requirements of these standards to provide some uh, specific and all kind of non halal najis and metagenes substances are not are forbidden. Ethanol can be used externally, but it needs to be properly labeled. Uh, on the other hand, all alcoholic beverages are not allowed for any external use. A gym use can be used if they are proved safe and uh, according to Sharia rules, should be uh, com uh, compliant, uh, conformity Sharia rules. Other, uh, other ingredients uh, are allowed as long as they are ensure the safety of consumers and not contain any energy sources, etc. Safety is very important. We need to be sure that there are enough scientific evidence for the safety of all these, all the things used. These evidence are the test reports and any other relevant documents uh, demonstrating that the final product and the raw materials and ingredient, ingredients applied are safe for consumers to use this is the professional way to ensure the safety of products. The organization should ensure that the raw materials, processes, products, and various machines and uh, any kinds of equipments, etc., shall not be affected by any najis or any non halal material during the stage of the preparation, processing, handling, labeling, packaging, storage, transport, and, and distribution. The organization, or means the producers, shall the take the re required measures to prevent any kind of nudges. Example of such action are effective by physical, uh, effective physical and separation and uh, maintaining clean, clean lines. It is not allowed to share the non-halal manufacturing facilities at the, uh, any stage of the production and of halal cosmetics. In case of uh, converting a processing line or equipment from non-halal to halal manufacture, all devices, utensils, and machines which were previously used shall be cleaned to uh, totally remove all non-halal and najis materials with appropriate cleaning methods, uh, which are in compliance with the GM with GMP. Uh, the GMP shall also be used in compliance with the requirement of ISO. Uh, 22 uh, 716. In the ingredients and raw materials, uh, bulk and the loose uh, products, labels and packaging material, equipment, apparatus, utensils, technology process, etc., used in the production of cosmetics shall be clearly traceable to the requirements of the, this standard at any stage of production and afterwards. Use of national or international regulation is the way to ensure the traceability. The good manufacturing practices, also I, I said, it should be uh, according to uh, ISO standards. Monitoring and actions, the organization shall continuously monitor all of these activities and take appropriate actions uh, and proactive measures in case of non-compliance uh, non or doubt 
it has to uh, demonstrate that all the requirements of the, these standards are continuously met at every stage of, uh, of the activities of the organization and only the products which are compliant to the requirements of the standard released to the, to the market or issued for use. Also, the GM, uh, GMP should be according to the ISO standards. Uh, the organization shall ensure that all employees uh, who are involved in the production of consumers are su suitably qualified and competent with the clearly defined responsibilities and authorities. In addition to this, they, sh they shall have throughout the knowledge of the standards. The organization shall uh, implement good manufacturing practices uh, which uh, complies with the requirement of these standards. The organization shall have producers procedures approved by the management of, for the implementing the standards and show its implement, implementation. Such procedures shall cover the entire spec, uh, spectrum of the activities of starting from the uh, procurement of the ingredients, machinery, etc. The organization shall maintain the records of the, uh, that support the fulfillment of the requirements of these standards. Such requirements are not limited to those uh, mentioned in the above uh, requirements. The record shall be legible and uh, secured, protected from uh, tampering, uh, readily and uh, re uh, retrievable, and uh, shall be retained for a period at least until the last day of the expiry, expiry of the given uh, cosmetic products. Uh, labeling is very important. Uh, the labels shall be uh, prominently and uh, cons uh, conspicuously displayed on the product at the point of sale of the name of the halal cosmetic product, and the batch uh, reference shall be displayed on the container or immediate package. Each container of halal cosmetics shall be labeled or uh, tagged in accordance with the national or international regulations and the market leg uh, legibly and in the uh, to be in accordance with these standards. The uh, shape of the packaging, physically from the, or packaging, and the contents of the labels and the advertisement of the cosmetic products shall, be, uh, not, con shall not contradict the Islamic ethics. The term halal shall be used only in the case of the compliance with the all requirements of the standards. Packaging uh, halal cosmetic products shall be suit uh, suitably packed using that packaging material will uh, fulfill the uh, following requirements. A packaging material shall not include any non-halal and najis materials. Equipment used in the preparation, processing, etc. shall be shall not be non-halal or najis. Preparation process and storage as the transportation of the packaging material shall be done in conditions which are physically separated from any other packaging material that does not meet the requirement uh, state in the A and B, uh, as I say mentioned. As a conclusion, uh, final words, CIMIC is the common platform to gather all stakeholders to contribute the common standards for the Muslim world and the, all international parties. CIMIC, why CIMIC 4 has passed through the several stage before it's published. Experts from uh, CIMIC member states and the license, such as the International Academy, made significant contribution for the finalization of this standard. So we recommend manufacturers and all other relevant actors of, of the halal cosmetic industry to implement wise CIMIC 4 halal cosmetic standard in, in their work and uh, area as the strategic way to achieve our ultimate goal, having a common standard to be recognized everywhere. In this context, we would like to glad to get your support and contribution for the next uh, version of the other standards. And this is my last words. I want to thank the chair. We got saved two minutes. He can for the questions. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Hassanoud, for your such informative uh, presentation. And I shall um, personally congratulate you because you've managed to finish uh, within the time given, and even you still have two minutes to go. Okay, and and uh, what I can recap for his presentation just yes, now, um, Smik, um, I shall um, congratulate Smik as well because managed to produce so far twelve standards, 
and 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 last year um, cosmetic was established uh, the standard for the cosmetic was established after four years of discussions and and he was also presenting on the several uh, general requirements for the uh, cosmetic and and once again um, please share me to give a round of applause to mr. Hassan for his presentation okay um, I shall remind uh, all of the audience as well, if you have any uh, questions, please um, um, take note that all the uh, question and answer session will be after all the presenter uh, finish their presentation. So we keep all the, um, the, the question and answer will be at the last of the uh, presentation by the last speaker later on, okay? And now we shall move to the second um, presenter for today. And our second presenter is um, Professor Dr. Nazima Hamid. She's a professor at School of Science, Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. Um, her expertise is in food science and food biotechnology. She um, graduated um, a Bachelor of Science Honours in Food Science from University of Nottingham, UK in 1991 and, and pursued for us a um, Master and, and graduated from University of Stars Clyde, um, UK in 1992 in uh, Master of Science in Food Biotechnology and PhD in Food Science from the same university in 1997. Uh, Dr. Azima will be uh, presenting today on the topic of value-added ingredient in cosmetic. Please, uh, Dr. Azima, floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, today I'm gonna talk about some um, ingredients uh, that you can um, add into cosmetics, and these are actually value-added ingredients. So um, there's a lot of move towards natural cosmetics because uh, there's a lot of chemicals in there and uh, there's issues of um, halal as well. And, and I thought that would be a good topic to talk about today because, you know, uh, what goes into natural cosmetics? And why do you want it? You want it because it's safe. And um, another thing is uh, they're, they're green cosmetics as well uh, and they are supposed to be more environmentally friendly. And I'll talk about uh, the use of seaweeds and mushrooms and a lot of things that we eat can actually go into cosmetics. Food waste valorization, uh, and uh, that's something that I do at uh, Auckland University of Technology. We turn waste products like uh, doing uh, byproducts from fruit processing, uh, for example, apricot seeds, avocado seeds. Uh, those are really useful things that you could implement in incorporate into uh, cosmetics as well. The issue of halal, it's, it's also very important. And uh, as you know, most of the fruits and vegetables, seaweeds, uh, those are actually halal sources as long as we do not use solvents. Yeah, you've got to be careful about the use of solvents. If they are extracted by water, um, then um, there will be a less, less of an issue uh, in terms of halal. So what are cosmetics? I don't need to go through this, but basically it's anything that you, you apply on your skin topically or you know, more uh, recently it's Nutri Cosmetics and those are supplements that you can consume uh, that um, gives you that you know, good looking skin. And uh, I'd like to talk about algal polysaccharides in cosmetics and uh, this is uh, a big thing uh, currently. So I've been going through uh, papers, and so uh, if you're interested in any of these papers, just email me, and I'm, I'm, I'll gladly uh, email it to you, because it's a lot of uh, really useful information. So um, we all know agar, yeah? Agar, we use it in our, um, if you eat food, it, you, you, it's a dessert, okay, in Malaysia, in uh, uh, in Thailand, yes. Uh, so, but you can also add it into your cosmetics because, uh, and uh, because it's a good emulsifier and stabilizer. 
it also helps control that moisture content because you always want your skin hydrated. And so agar is a really good source. So if you want something that is oil-free, agar is a good uh, substitute uh, in cosmetics. There are a variety of um, crude polysaccharides in, in algae. And uh, if you think about it, most of the time we assume they have to be uh, extracted by solvents. But that's not necessary because a lot of the water-soluble polysaccharides are also quite good in terms of, and you can see here, they've uh, not only got good hydrating potential, yeah, so in terms of um, absorbing moisture, yeah, so um, it helps you retain that moisture on your skin. And then um, this big thing, the antioxidant activity. Yeah, so we have a lot of radical um, species around, you know, uh, due to stress, due to the environment. And so um, it's really good to have that added benefit of antioxidants. And uh, we can get all this uh, by uh, polysaccharides that you, you can see here from a variety of seaweed. This is kombu. Kombu is Saccharina japonica. We eat it yeah, uh, with uh, sushi and it, it will look like this. Yeah? It's funny, the seaweed is brown, but when you uh, process it, yeah, it, it turns a nice green. And uh, there's also, you can see that a lot of the seaweeds have got high uh, um, free radical scavenging ability, and, and that's good because it reuse, re it's anti-aging. Okay, it helps you age gracefully. Uh, another added benefit is uh, its inflammatory properties. So uh, if you have allergies, yeah, so um, it's anti-inflammatory. So a lot of these natural algal polysaccharides are actually useful. Fucoidin. Uh, fucoidin is a sulfated polysaccharide. And uh, I used to work on it a lot, uh, maybe about seven years ago. And we, we do a lot of seaweed work uh, in New Zealand because really seaweed is a pest. Yeah, if uncontrolled, it can wreak havoc. And so what do people do? They fish out the seaweed and they throw it away. Okay, it's a lot of it is used as fertilizer, but there's a lot of potential in terms of using it as an as a cosmetic ingredient. And you can see here, there is the fucus and sargassum, okay? Uh, and they are, they are really good in terms of antioxidant. And uh, look here, with fucus, it's, it can reduce melanogenesis. And what I mean is that it can inhibit tyrosinase activity, and so it can help uh, clarify your skin, yeah? It's a skin whitening ingredient. And uh, you, I, another thing is uh, you can have uh, UV, y you can prevent UVB damage, yeah? A and that's important too, because uh, with UV radiation, your skin ages, yeah? So uh, if you think about people in the Western country, that's what happens when they go out in the sun. And so you can use a variety of um, ingredients uh, naturally that can give you all these benefits. I'll just show you some pictures of um, uh, where we get our seaweed. So we get our seaweed from the Marlborough Sounds in Pilora Sounds here. And you can see um, they're all here. They're grown all here. Uh, uh, it, it's and uh, this is what it looks like. If you see the seaweed, that's my student there. Yeah, you can see how big and uh, you know how much seaweed you can get. And really, this is all being you know thrown away. I'll just show you um, a quick uh, recap of uh, you know what what uh, you can get from these polysaccharides. Uh, just um, this study uh, in particular looked at the screen skin protection ability, and you can see you know it's really got high antioxidant capacity. It's got um, you can inhibit tyrosinase, so you can have that skin whitening uh, ability in your formulations. And uh, moisture preserving ability. 
Yeah, so, so it's really great ingredient. You can get all this from natural sources. Mushrooms, yeah, we eat them. But uh, really, it, it's starting to become a very popular ingredient in a lot of the cosmetics that are being formulated today. Fluorotus is uh, a species that's commonly used, and if you know shiitake, shiitake is a fluorotus species uh, that you don't only eat, but you can also use in cosmetics. And the reason, because uh, they have this polysaccharide, the beta-glucans, and they are really, really good uh, because they are not only uh, good in terms of uh, providing that antioxidant activity, uh, but it can also um, be effective in uh, problems with dermatitis. And uh, that can be alleviated by uh, the use of mushrooms. Of course, it has that skin whitener thing that a lot of uh, people seem to go for because as you age, what happens is you get a lot of melanogenesis happening and so you, know, you, you want to stop that or you want to slow that down and yeah, uh, mushrooms are great too. If you look at what sort of cosmetics contain mushrooms, there are quite a big variety out there and uh, they've used um, the chaga and shiitake mushroom here yeah? the snow mushroom, uh, the rishi mushroom. And you can see that um, mushrooms are not only, you know, food, it can be used in cosmetics, um, it's also used in the pharmaceutical industry, so it's a really, really um, good, you know, food and uh, cosmetic uh, maybe uh, ingredient in future. I'll not go through uh, this. I will just show you the variety of uh, products that actually uh, contain these um, mushrooms. And you can see uh, Ganodoma here is it, big, okay? And it's used a lot. So I'll just flick through and just go through a few. Uh, the Rishi mushroom is also the Lingji mushroom and uh, they have got that skin whitening property and it's used a lot in your facial mask. Then there's the tremella and the tremella or the snow mushroom um, is uh, it's a good alternative to your hyaluronic acid because it also has uh, that uh, moisture uh, binding cap capacity so it can increase the hydration property of your formulations. In addition, uh, it has a strong anti-inflammatory property. So if you just add hyaluronic acid, yeah, it only serves as um, uh, something that produces hydration. But when you use something natural, there are always other added benefits. And uh, the, you, you can get also uh, products from lactic acid fermentation and these are your probiotics. So if you think about, uh, these are actually the bacteria that's found in your gut. They're the good bacteria. And you can uh, ferment a variety of natural sources like mint leaves, yeah? And uh, what they can do is they can give that UVB protection, which is really necessary because of the thinning of our ozone layer. Another interesting uh, application is the use of these um, lactic acid bacteria um, cultures uh, and uh, what they can do is they can produce surface active uh, compounds, then uh, they become your biosurfactants instead of the chemical surfactants like SDS which is environmentally unfriendly. So, you know, uh, it's quite good uh, to be considering, considering this sort of natural alternatives. I, I'd like to talk about fruits. Okay, I didn't have that in my abstract, but I think fruits are the way to go. You see a lot of cosmetics with a picture of avocado on it and olive oil, and that's what's driving buyers. They want something more natural today. 
Anona, this is uh, Buanona, and you can get this in Malaysia. Yeah, it's a very, very, uh, you do it here in Thailand too. It's wonderful. You can use everything from the fruits to the seeds. I think there's some work here done at uh, HSC as well. And you can see the fruit, the seed, it's got all potential co cosmetic ingredients that you can use. So it's quite um, really interesting. You can use uh, the leaves, the tree barks. Yeah, I can see some nodding there. And yeah, it, it's quite exciting. Saffron. Yeah, that's quite common, but it's a bit expensive, so probably not. What next? Uh, I work with avocado, and so a lot of uh, the avocados in New Zealand, we, we, may, we turn it to avocado oil. So what do they do? They throw away the peel, they throw away the seed, yeah? And you think about it, the peels and the seeds, they're really high in antioxidant activities, and currently uh, I'm working on avocado seeds and even apricot seeds. So, you know, if we can look forward to some collaboration, um, you know, with, with uh, HSC on, you know, using some of these ingredients, useful ingredients. So instead of throwing them away, yeah, this is an environmentally friendly way of using the waste. Yes, you can see these are the halal cosmetic ingredients that are used, and you can see a lot of the natural uh, you know, compounds that I've discussed are not even in the list because, yeah, you know, people don't think much. But really, if you, if you see the Western world, what, what they're doing now is to move towards more natural cosmetics. And, you know, I think it's, it's the way to go. All right. So to conclude, um, I, I think it's very important, um, Prof. Vinay, talked about ingredients, yeah? what goes in our food, what goes into our cosmetics. These are all important ingredients. And um, let's look at the use of natural ingredients instead. And um, uh, that way, it will also link to the halal issues, because you're using something more natural. And uh, th there's a lot of scientific work that needs to be done in this area. And I look forward to any collaboration with any one of you. Um, we've got wonderful ingredients out there, and yes, thank you very much for inviting me here and um, sharing this uh, exciting uh, topic of ingredients in cosmetics with you today. I thank you, um, the organizing committee at Chulalongkorn University and um, the wonderful audience here today. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank uh, to Prof. Dr. Nazima for such very enlightening presentation pertaining um, why we have to uh, use natural cosmetic um, and the advantages of using such uh, uh, algal uh, polysaccharide in cosmetic. And, and she did mention something um, uh, new that uh, maybe uh, new to me that I, I just come to know that there are some of the, um, we call it uh, nutri cosmetic now. Uh, so what you need, uh, what you eat actually, it just also, because previously when we, when we mentioned about the cosmetic, it just uh, came across to my mind, it's just about lipsticks, it's just about, you know, um, eyeshadows and so on. But now when talking about cosmetic, it's not only about how to beauty yourself, but it's also very important how to make yourself is very healthy. And, and from the food that you eat and so on, that can contribute towards the, um, the so-called nutri cosmetic as well. So, um, and uh, the message from Prof. Azima just now, she do invite uh, everyone if um, would like to get some of her latest publications uh, in, in, in Halal Cosmetic, Please, uh, please do not hesitate to contact her personally and get those uh, papers being published. Okay, um, and now um, I shall move to the third presenter for today. Um, our third uh, speaker is um, uh, Miss Dewi Rija Sari. Uh, Miss Dewi Rija, she is the founder and expert consultant at the DRS Consulta Indonesia. Um, 
Her area of expertise is the pharmaceutical science and pharmaceutical technology. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Pharmaceutical Science and Master of Science in Pharmaceutical Technology from Technology Bandung uh, or Institute of Technology, uh, which is known as ATB or ITB in uh, Bandung, uh, Indonesia. So uh, she will be presenting today the topic of um, uh, our presentation is overview of halal, a critical point of cosmetic and nutraceutical industry perspective. Please, uh, Ms. Rija. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, highly appreciate to the organizing committee who already invited me as one of the speaker in this event. It's an honor for me. This morning I will bring you a brief overview on the halal critical point of cosmetic and nutraceutical from industry perspective. Uh, the, orga the moderator already informed my background a little bit. Uh, I just would like to add uh, some of the activity for the part of external affairs. I also sit as executive chairman of Indonesia International Cosmetic Association and uh, vice president scientific affairs of the ASEAN Cosmetic Associations and also expert team member for Indonesia Cosmetic Associations. My past working experience are mostly in the pharmaceutical food supplements and cosmetic companies. And early this year, I just started to uh, develop an independent institution that provide personalized consulting services in the area of research and development, product development, halal assurance system, safety assessment, GMP, and scientific regulatory affairs. I also has interest in the cosmetic safety assessors, and I took education in Frey University, Brussels, and also in Germany. Let's start uh, some key topics that I will brought up this morning. Introduction, traceability concept in halal, halal critical point for the material and production, and some recommendation. As we all know that the existing worldwide Muslim population, about around 1 point billion, and more than 50% are sitting in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and South Asia Muslim population here. Halal is a basic requirement for Muslim consumer and market demands of halal product are predicted at growing trends in the coming years. For the halal nutraceuticals are increasingly focused on the functionality, whilst for the halal cosmetic sector continue to expand as more products are produced and ingredients are increasingly halal certified. If you can see the numbers of the value in 2017 to the prediction of 2023, it's more than 50% growing for the pharmaceutical halal and also for the cosmetics. Why nutraceuticals and cosmetics should be halal? For sure, because the nutraceuticals are consumed orally and uh, both nutraceutical and co cosmetic the materials might be derived from haram or nitis material. And some cosmetic product could be absorbed into the skin or could be swallowed accidentally, for example, like lip care products such as lipstick and also toothpaste. And some cosmetic formulation might hindrance the Islamic ablution ritual with some technology formulation, waterproof, sweatproof, or long lasting. So if we talk about the nutraceutical and cosmetic industry, the traceability concept in halal is very important why we can say the product is halal because the material use is fulfilled halal requirement and also the production facility is not contaminated by haram or nitrous materials. However, if we see the product flow of the nutraceutical and cosmetic from the production to the point of sales, we see there are a lot of uh, ways, not only in the production uh, process, but also in the distribution chains. Furthermore, if the product being imported or exported, you can see the chain even more longer. Some challenges facing by the industry for nutraceutical and cosmetics, uh, I can make it into three groups. The first in uh, material, a lot of material types being used and also there are new ingredient evolution and multiple sources 
either producer or production side. While for formulation, the complexity of formulation become the very challenging topic because for example, like in cosmetic, we use around 10 to 30 ingredients in one product. And uh, also the expansion of formulation technology also challenging for us. For the product, both products are following the trends and also have very limited product life cycle. And also now the types of product is only, not only the uh, uh, semi-solid or solid, but also increase into the new type of products. I would like to uh, highlight a bit about the halal critical point in the material and product formulations. As we know, the type of material being used in nutraceutical and cosmetics uh, can be grouping into four groups. The first one is the product formulation, which is material used in the formulation and become part of the finished product composition. The second group is additives and processing aids, which is uh, not become part of the finished product formulation, but being used in the process, such as enzyme and catalyze. The third group is primary packaging, material used as primary packaging of the finished product. It also can be consumed, for example, like gelatin using uh, for the soft capsule or hard capsule, and also some concern in the primary packaging for plastic material because uh, some of the plasticizer also uh, have the non-halal materials. The fourth group is the applicator, material used to apply the finished product, for example, like the cosmetic brush, because it can be from the haram materials. Uh, while for the source of material, we can use uh, quite various source of material, for example, like from plants, chemical synthetic, microbial, animal, and other source. Uh, there are some concerns, for example, in the plant, uh, the additive being used, the processing aids, and also in the chemical synthetic, the coating agents, and for the microbial, the concern are for the source of media, processing aids, and the source of genes, if the product is GMO. And for the animal source, the concern is species of animal slaughtering process, additive, and processing aids. The remaining uh, material can be sourced from human, uh, for example, keratin, it can be from human hair, is forbidden for halal product. This is the visualization how complexity of the product formulation for nutraceutical and also for cosmetic because consists of various material from multiple producer and or production sites. If we take one formulation, it contains more than one material. And if we take one material, it can be from different producer. Most of the industry, they always have backup suppliers. So it means that for one material, we usually use two or three suppliers. And one suppliers or producer, they have more than one factory. So in terms of traceability, it's quite challenging for the industry. Uh, therefore, uh, I would like to link the presentation from uh, Professor Winay Dahlan. It is important to have each book which is I quote li here is in the positive list of uh, halal material, positive mm -hmm. list. This is some concern uh, of the material. Uh, mm -hmm. We can see the critical activities, the material selection, identification, procurement, delivery, and transportation and storage is very important and critical because there are some potential for mistaken and cross-contamination. And uh, how about the production process? As you know, uh, not all the brand owner produce their own product in their own factory, but they also can produce in the subcontractor facility. And if you see the factory or subcontract can be from different uh, source, city or countries. And we need to ensure whether they use sharing facility or they use the dedicated facility. In this case, uh, segregation at the point of weighing, production process, packaging, process, storage, and st transportation is very crucial. The activities in production also, for example, like incoming check and sampling materials of the halal uh, materials, weighing process, the production process, and the storage because of the potential for mistaken and cross-contamination. 
this is a visualization of the halal production facility uh, because uh, they use the sharing facility. I mean, the building they use sharing facility, but they but they use the identification of halal production area and the tools to avoid any cross contamination. Other critical points in production, among others, is more to the administrative process, but it's really important, such as written procedure, product traceability, internal audit, and management review. I think the nutraceutical and cosmetic industry to supposed to establish internal system which cover material, process, product, personnel, and procedure in order to ensure consistency of halal product, which we call it halal assurance system. So some recommendation from uh, industry perspective, because it is also linked with my previous experience as the um, internal halal coordinator in the multinational cosmetic company handling uh, six plants uh, from three countries, uh, Indonesia, China and India. There are some uh, recommendations, probably uh, you as a scientist and also the government could bridging these uh, difficulties or the constraint for the industry sector. The first is the material selection and identification for nutraceutical and cosmetic have become a critical activities in the initial process to ensure halalness of the product at the upstream level. A common reference of positive list halal material is beneficial at this stage. Uh, starting uh, last year, I also uh, initiate the task force in Indonesia to work hand in hand with the Assessment Institute of uh, Indonesia Council of Ulama to expand their positive list uh, because in at the beginning, uh, the Indonesia Council of Ulama only have three kinds of positive list. The first one, general uh, positive list. The second one, uh, flavor positive list. And the third one, fragrance positive list. So uh, I, I'm initiated the, the work in the cosmetic association to uh, submit the list of ingredients uh, being used in the cosmetic that can be included in the positive list. The formulation of nutraceutical and cosmetics are quite complex which includes various type of material from multiple producer and all production sites. Therefore, the halalness traceability of each material has become a big challenge for the industries. Again, if we have the positive list of material being used, it's very helpful for the industry. And the third recommendation is the comprehensive halal assurance system shall be developed in order to ensure halalness of the finished product and ensure consistent halal implementation within the industries. Last but not least, considering global demand of halal nutraceuticals and cosmetics, then halal provision alignment at the international level might facilitate and accelerate market access and cross-border trades of the product. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Ms. Devi Rija Sari, for your presentation. Um, what I can recap from your presentation, you're talking about the importance of um, uh, nutraceutical and cosmetic, and then the most important part is the halal critical point that includes uh, such as product information, additive process, uh, processing aids, and primary packaging applications. and, and she did also mention about the importance of the hedge number, but um, in her presentation, she named it as positive list instead of the hedge, okay, the hedge number, okay? And she did also uh, mention some of recommendation that's um, in her presentation. Uh, and now we come to the last, but not least, uh, from the least, but at last, uh, our, our, our young um, scientist um, today is uh, Miss Cassini, or her name in, in, in uh, Malay, she called um, Miss Farida, I'm correct? Yes. Yeah, uh, Miss Farida. So Miss Farida is um, a research assistant at the Halal Science Center from Chulalongkorn University, and 
She um, currently a PhD candidate uh, at Chulalongkorn Nukon University, and she um, graduated from uh, Chulalongkorn Nukon University in biochemistry and uh, Master of Science in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology uh, from Chulalongkorn Nukon University. So, uh, Ms. Kassini will be uh, presenting on the halal science and technology for quality assurance and authentication in cosmetic ingredients. So please, uh, Ms. Farida, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Shah. Uh, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Farida Geleka, and today I would like to present you on the topic of halal science and technology for quality assurance and authentications in cosmetic ingredients. Uh, first of all, I would like to give you some information about the Halan cosmetic uh, market nowadays. Uh, among the traditional market across the world, uh, they are getting saturated. However, the Halan cosmetic is uh, reported the, fa the fastest growth of the market uh, in recent years. And there are three factors that result to the increasing of the Halan market in recent year. Firstly, is the increasing of the Muslim populations worldwide. The report is in the the report in the 2015 report that the Muslim population is account for 24.1 percent, and the number is gradually uh, increased uh, to to make up one part one in in three uh, in the next uh, 14 years. Uh, the second result is that the increasing of health concerns among the consumer bef uh, to, the, the cons to the product that they use. So they try to find out some uh, special product. Even they have to pay more for the special one, so they appreciate to, to pay more. And the, the third, reason that it is the because the increasing of the uh, uh, Muslim uh, awareness for their uh, religion obligation so that they and more and moreover they have uh, higher educations and they have uh, uh, more information about the ingredient that they consume so that's why the increasing of the halal market uh, in cosmetic is uh, a report. And in, in order to focus into the productions of the Halan cosmetic, firstly we have to focus on the ingredients that is, has been used in the cosmetic ingredients, uh, in the cosmetics uh, product. Uh, it can be divided into eight groups according to their functionality, which, I, which are uh, water, humectants, oil and fat and wax and surfactants, then it's color and perfume and preservatives. Uh, I will make, I will give more detail in the next slide. The first uh, ingredient is the humectant that's used in cosmetic. This material is used as an agent used to absorb moisture from atmosphere to forming as a thin film over the textures of the skin and prevents their dryness. Uh, the humectants, humectants that use in cosmetic nowadays can be divided into three groups of the, which are the inorganic humectants, metal in, uh, humectants and organic uh, humectants, but mostly organic humectants was used in the cosmetic for example, uh, ethylene glycol, propylene glycol, and glycerol or sorbitol, they have a uh, uh, polyhydrate group in their functional in their functions. Uh, they have it has been some report about the limit the limitations of using inorganics and metal organics in the cosmetic because they they cause some quality to nature. So some country are limited of use these uh, materials in, in their products. The next group will be uh, oil, fat, and wax used in cosmetic uh, can be divided into five groups 
based on their origins. The first is the animal fat and oil come from uh, 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 fat and oil that derive from animals. The second is oil derived from vegetable uh, or plants, mm -hmm. and third is the wax, and the the fourth one is wool grease or such as la lanolin. Uh, the last one will be the biotech or uh, synthesis of some uh, fat and oil like ceramide. Uh, fat and oil and wax play an important role in the cosmetic formula. Some of them derive from, like, like what I say, that some of them derive from plants and some derive from the animals and, and chemical reactions. The oily material is controlled the uh, evaporation of the moisture of the skin and used uh, mainly to improve the feelings of juice. The next ingredient is the surfactants. There are a very large number of, of, of them, but they share a similar molecular structure. Uh, according to the mo molecular structure, it has, a it has a path with an affinity for oil, and they have a long, sh long hydro hydrophobic chain. The, nat the nature of surfactant is cosmetic, including the co coconut-derived uh, surfactants, vegetable-derived surfactant, and sugar-derived surfactant. They are available to use in the cosmetic, and they are uh, accepted for to use in the Halan cosmetics as well. Perfume used in cosmetic can be uh, extracted from fruit and from uh, animals, and can be derived by chemical synthesis as well. Uh, the use of perfume extracted from the animal. Uh, may not be some issue in introducing into the Halan cosmetic. Uh, for examples of the fragrance that can be extract from animal, such as uh, ember grass, musk, seaweed, uh, and so on. Uh, this slide show you the preservative that use in cosmetic. Uh, there can be, uh, it has been some report about the, the uh, not allowed to use some, uh, preser some these preservative in the cosmetic because of the carcinogenic effect to, uh, to, to skin, such as uh, paraben like and uh, formaldehyde ingredients. Uh, however, uh, Organic acids such as uh, propionic or sorbic acids and benzoic acids can be uh, accept to, to use in the Halan cosmetic. Uh, this is the Toyib case, the, the Toyib issue because uh, the, the it's so like uh, food safety. We, we, we may not uh, allow the use of uh, carcinogenic agent to, to in, in formulate the, the Halan cosmetic. Uh, this is the antioxidants that can be used in cosmetic, for example, of uh, vitamin C and vitamin E, and a phyto uh, antioxidant consists of the polyphenols and terpenes. Some of antioxidants can be derived from uh, enzyme like super, ox super oxide dismutase, which can be derived from bovine and mari marine sauce and glutathione peroxidase and some is catalase. Uh, this is used in the cosmetic formula, formula because most of the cosmetic contain unsaturated bond. In particular, it is uh, presumed that fat and oil with two or more unsaturated bond uh, are easily oxidized. So the reactions produce the compound which bad smell or cause Sa uh, safety problem like skin irritation to prevent the smell. It is necessary to add antioxidant to cosmetic in order to control uh, the oxidation reactions. So as for my slide, you can see that in the Halan standard point of view, we can uh, 
categorized into five groups based on their origins of the ingredients. Firstly is the animal-derived ingredients, the plant-based derived ingredients, mineral-derived ingredients, and synthesis-derived ingredients, and the, the last is the uh, fermentation ingredients. Uh, if you have some concerns about the uh, based on their origin, like for example, the use of the solvent extracting, like using alcohol extracting, and also the use of some uh, fermentation from bacteria. And for the color that used in the cosmetic, it can be derived from inorganic color, like from the chemical synthesis, and also can be derived from uh, uh, animals or some insect like cochineal insects, as we call carmine. Carmine can be used in both cosmetic and in the food as well. Carmine is the E1120. Uh, uh, the replacements of carmine is one or uh, E124, which is the carmoisin, which is the red color as well. They c it can be replaced, the use of carmine in both cosmetic and in the food uh, industry as well. So we try to separate the carmine and carmoisin uh, using the UHPLC. This is the preliminary study. And with using the C18 column and the uh, and the gradients of the acetate buffer. And for the Halan cosmetic uh, standard in Thailand, we follow like uh, His Excellency Doc, uh, Mr. Yesan said that it's, ha it's already published for CMIC, for, uh, for Halan standard of CMIC. So in Thailand, we are going to develop a Halan standard that can be used in the context of Thailand. So we, in last year, in Thailand Halan Assembly 2018, we are uh, opened for public hearings about the Halan cosmetic uh, uh, in Thailand last year. And so, uh, so for, the last slide, I would like to thank you very much for your coming for our event today. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Farida, for your, your such wonderful presentation, talking about uh, eight different types of raw material used in cosmetic, among others, that's uh, hemectins, surfactants, and source of different ingredients used in cosmetic. And, and now um, we come to the end of um, our session. And before that, I would uh, give roughly about 15 minutes, is it, for the uh, question and answer session? Only five minutes. Also, we don't have uh, much time. So um, please, um, uh, if you have any questions, just make it a uh, very short question and precise uh, questions because um, just mention your name and your affiliations, maybe uh, your institution, uh, and, and please uh, uh, address the particular, uh, mention particular uh, speakers that you would like to address your question. And you have uh, any question, please do now. Any, any question from the floor? Yeah, so, so the rule said that if there are no questions from the floor, then the, uh, <laughs> the moderator should address some questions. Okay. Um, okay. Um, no? Okay. Prof. Saimi, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I would like to ask a question uh, to Mrs. Rija. Eh? You mentioned, you showed the picture of the factory, halal, uh, the cosmetic factory label with halal. Could you tell us where was, where was the factory located? Uh, thank you 
for your question. Uh, it is an example, the factor in China, because they use they are using the the same building as non halal uh, products. However, they put the identification of the facility and also the tools or equipment being used just dedicated for halal products. Thank you. So maybe one last question. Okay. Please. Uh, any mic? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I'm from Adult Certification Services, India. India, okay. Yes. I have a question with uh, Dr. Nazima Hamid. I know, I want to know the alkyl polysaccharide, the function and the mechanism of action, and also how long it can be used. Third question, for what type of skin it can be used? So three questions. Yes. So I said one, okay, but okay. <laughs> okay, okay, never mind. So Dr. Together, Nazima yes. has a very kind of uh, heard that so she's going three in so one. three in one, okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for the thank question. You. I could give you a lecture on that actually, <laughs> but probably uh, we can talk about the other two questions later on, maybe during um, tea, tea time or after lunch. During yeah, the break. That, that would be the yeah. best idea, okay. I think, yeah, because um, the mechanism itself, it, it, that's the thing, there's a lot of biochemistry going on with uh, these uh, natural compounds. And uh, it's a bit hard to explain without having, uh, you know, a cycle here to 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 show that. But um, uh, maybe what what is your third question? Um, could you repeat that again? Maybe I can answer that. Yes, I want to know the function and the mechanism action of the uh, the algae polysaccharides. Yeah. Uh, well, there's that antioxidant activity. Then that there's that's that hydration uh, ability as well. And so there are a lot of mechanisms. It's a bit hard to answer that on stage. Uh, I can direct you to some, some papers that uh, goes, you know, that describes this in detail. I, I'm sure you're a biochemist. Uh, do you have a biochemistry background? Yeah, Ma probably. Pharmacology. Yeah, pharmacology. yeah so pharmacology, yeah. yeah. So that'll be of interest to you, but for the general <laughs> audience, probably uh, not. But I'm, I'm happy to email you those uh, publications. I, is that all right? Okay. Yeah, Thank I'll get your card later okay. on Thanks. and yeah, happily uh, share that uh, information for you. Okay, so thanks for uh, Prof. Azima for your such uh, uh, answer and, and suggestion to the um, our gentleman uh, who addressed the, the question just now. Okay, um, since we really um, run out of time, so he's supposed to stop the uh, question and, and answer session now. And um, please join me um, to give a big applause to our all speakers for this session. And, and, and take this uh, opportunity one, uh, once again to thank all the audience for, their, um, for your attention and for your fully support to this session. And, and with that, I would like to um, give back this mic to the Ms. MC today. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, topic from uh, all speakers today. It's, uh, it's uh, new and very interesting. So now, uh, may I invite Assistant Professor Dr. Wanida Nopon Pan, Deputy Director of the Halal Science Center, to give a token of appreciation to the keynote, to the speaker, the honorable speakers, and chairperson. Please, Professor Wanida on the stage. May I invite uh, His Excellency Isan Owood, uh, Secretary General of 
CIMIC and OIC to uh, give a token of pre-talk, take the appreciation for the very special topic speech today. And may I invite Professor Dr. Nasima Hamid from Auckland University uh, for the very interesting presentation on value-added ingredients in Halan cosmetics. Thank you, Doc, Professor Dr. Nasima Hamid, for a very uh, presentation, very good presentation. And may I invite Ms. Devi Rijazari. She is the founder and expert consultant, DRS Consulta Indonesia. That she's a uh, talking about overview on Halan critical point of cosmetics and nutraceutical industry perspective. Thank you. And may I invite Ms. Kesini Ketleha. Uh, she is the PhD candidate and research assistant from the Halan Science Center, Shulalongkorn University. For her Topic is Halan Science and Technology for Quality Assurance and Authentication in Cosmetic Ingredients. And may I invite our chairperson today, Dr. Muhammad Ropanning Sulong. He is a senior lecturer at TDCGS Science and Biotechnology University, Selangor, Malaysia, for moderating today. And may I invite all speakers in the front of the stage for a photo session, please? Thank you very much for our speakers for a very uh, special and interesting topic for today on session one is Halan Cosmetic and Nutraceutical Science. For the session two is the very interesting also. Session two is a uh, big data driven innovation in Halan industries and modernized marketing. The session chair is Professor Dr. Komarutin Abdul Somad from Center of for East and South East Asian Studies, Lund University, Sweden. And the topic of the, the speakers today in the session two is artificial intelligence or AI and data analytic improvement of digitalization of Halan supply chain from the Professor Dr. Abdul Aziz Buros and the blockchain technology in the context of production and certification risk and recommendation from Mr. Buan Malik and how to how blockchain supports the ecosystem of global Halan economy from Mr. Abdullah Kuang Yu Han and the last Topic is blockchain technology enhancing Halan production and certification system by Dr. Pradhan Priya Supri Pong. The session show is begin now. May I invite Professor Dr. Kamaruddin Abdul Somad, Center for All East and Southeast Asian Studies, Lund University, Sweden, to be our session chair for today on the stage. Please welcome Professor Dr. Komaruddin Abdul Somad.
And may I invite Professor Dr. Abdul Aziz Buros from the Qatar University. His ex area of expertise is computer science and ICT engineering. Please welcome. And may I invite Dr. Buat Malik from uh, the Central Bank of Qatar. Please welcome Dr. Buat Malik. Area of his expertise is cyber security and digital innovation. And may I invite Mr. Abdullah Kuang Yuhan from the Islamic Finance uh, Kitmir Network, UAE. Please welcome. And may I invite Dr. Paradon Supripo, Assistant Director of the Halan Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, on the stage. And I will uh, let this stage for the session chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can I use this? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, Let's start because we otherwise you won't have any lunch today. <laughs> um, welcome to this session and our four uh, presenters. Uh, if you look at uh, my group here, I might face a disciplinary action at my university because uh, I'm a gender bias here, right? <laughs> I left the last session because <laughs> It is very equal uh, presenter between the gender. That, that's a joke for, the, for this morning, okay. Um, the, the topics that uh, the four uh, expert today will be presenting uh, have already announced by our announcer. So uh, do you think that I should repeat the CV again, <laughs> uh, because you all have uh, books of abstracts, you know. I mean, uh, so I just uh, go very fast with the, the first speakers. You know. uh, he is Professor Dr. Abdul Aziz uh, on the right hand of me, and. The area of expertise is computer science uh, and ICT for engineering. And uh, the one that uh, sitting beside uh, Professor Abdul Aziz is Dr. Malik from uh, uh, y y sorry from Qatar. And his area of expertise is cybersecurity and digital innovation. Yes, thank you. And on the left hand side of my uh, my seat here is Mr. Han Abdul Mr. Abdullah. Guang Yu Han, and he is a co-founder and managing director of uh, Halal Chain Foundation, uh, Kutmi, right? Uh, Networks, UAE. And last, uh, Dr. Paradon Suripong. And Dr. Paradon is uh, expert in uh, and he will be presenting the topic on uh, a blockchain also. So I happen to chair this uh, four gentlemen because uh, my main research area is open innovation. So all of, all of us have been talking about that. Uh, so in order not to prolong the time, I would like to uh, invite Professor Dr. Abdul Aziz for his uh, presentation. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. Okay, so um, I try to be brief uh, in my talk, and I will try to talk about the analytics, how we use the analytics um, in the supply chain. But uh, before going deep in the in in the talk. Yeah, yeah, I want just to remind uh, about the different kind of supply chains or let's start talking about the traditional supply chain. So it's very simple uh, in all the applications, in the, all the areas. So you have, uh, we talk about the suppliers, the uh, uh, manufacturers, the distributors, the retailers, etc., and mainly the customers. And uh, the problem what is happening these last years is we have uh, big uh, issues related to the globalization the mass customization and the problem with um, uh, natural resources. We have less and less. So this is turning the, this linear model to uh, a model which is circular. We call it the circular model of the supply chain. But before going to that model, um, actually it's here, <laughs> uh, we still have problems and issues related to the accuracy of the information. Why? Because we have uh, a lack of visibility of the data itself from the end to end. We have problems related to the integration because we have an information system behind this design, behind this supply chain. And the real problem that we have today is the information integration and what we call the interoperability. Why? Because we have different systems and these systems are using different languages, different uh, approaches, and then when it comes to exchange the information and the data, we have a real problem. So talking about the supply chain, there is no difference if it's supply chain or in the agricultural applications or in the industry or etc. So we have exactly the same problems. Um, we have also problems related to the reliability of the information. In most of the time, we don't know really if we have the real information uh, at our hands or no. And I think our colleagues will talk a little bit about the, uh, how we use the blockchain, for example, in terms of trust of the information uh, in terms of reliability, etc., And of course, the problem of the agility, um, the problems uh, that we have in, in the supply chain is we are losing a lot of time because the uh, supply chains models that we are using are not agile. Um, just to go back to the uh, information system, just to let you understand what is the problem, when we talk about the supply chain, we can see at least these information systems. You know, We talk about the ERP, uh, the enterprise resource planning to uh, make planning of the actions in the supply chain. We talk about the um, customer relationship management tools. We talk about supplier relationship because we manage all the information, all the relationship between the partners using systems. Uh, and these systems, as I said, are creating, of course, solutions, but in the same time, they are creating a real problem of integration. They are not integrated. And of course, most of the vendors behind, I don't give names, but they are happy about this situation. And more it is difficult, more they can create patches and more the companies will pay to find solutions. But definitely the solutions are just um, temporary because you know, as soon as they integrate their system, then you have to pay again for another patch. So this is, it's known, it's a game, and this is also the business of the vendors. They have to play this game to, to let you paying all the time. But having a global, in the same time, a global system managing the supply chain is impossible. Why? Because we have different kind of information. The semantics itself of the information is completely different if you are a supplier or a manufacturer or transporter. It's a, you don't talk the same language. And that's why you need different levels of semantics. And then the matching between or the integration of these systems it's, uh, becomes almost impossible. So this is known everywhere. And if you take the aeronautics, for example, they have the most complex supply chain uh, because they have uh, hundreds or sometimes uh, thousands of pieces of parts to be supplied uh, to have the simple product. So this is the, the picture that shows you that why the supply chains today are not optimized seriously. Then uh, another issue. Uh, beyond the, the information system because, as I told you, the vendor managed actually to give you the patches, to give you a solution. You pay it very expensive, but you will have it definitely and it will work. Now the problem is the problem of the standardization. Uh, when you take the global supply chain in general, 
we classify the supply chain levels as the product itself because I have to track it and then until they, 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 they arrive to the customer or beyond, even also during his life, until the end of the life of the product. Then we have the processes, the second level, and then we have the company level itself, the enterprise. So if you, I, I put here just a few standards, and you can see that we have gaps. So in some areas, we don't have standards. Why? Because the products are more and more complex, and we don't have standards. Maybe the standardization bodies still did not agree about standards. Or you have a standard which is valid, for example, in Asia, and not valid in America or in Europe, etc. So there is a big gap today, and it's known. So here, when you don't have the standards, then it's the, say, the, the space of play uh, for the vendors. Here, they can put what they want. They will put just their standards or their solutions, and you are forced to use it. So this is the second gap. Very important to agree to have standards. And I think this community is doing exactly this role uh, today. So this is very important in the supply chain. Then I talked about the integration and interoperability. This is just a small example that we did with our PhD students uh, with a pharmaceutical industry company. And you can see here, as I told you, there is no integration. They have several systems here. I put just six or seven. And these systems are not communicating. Of course, they are communicating, but not in the best way, not in the optimized way. So the company because they wanted to integrate these systems, they are trying to build themselves different levels. We talk about the model itself, so we try to find kind of interoperability between the models, between the languages, between the meta model, the meta meta model, etc. So we come, we create a kind of complex machine, uh, and that's the only way actually to make this interoperability between the different levels. But again, it doesn't solve all the issues, but it costs for the companies, it costs for the um, for the supply chain. So this is just a small example. I will not go deep in details, but you can see the complexity of the issue. So if you want to solve really the, the interoperability and the integration, there is a huge work to do within the supply chain. Um, and on the top of this, today we are talking about the digital transformation, which is a reality. Why? Because we have new technologies, advanced technologies coming to the market, talking about satellites, sensors, drones, robotics, big data, data learning. So now we have another level, which is very important, definitely, uh, because now we can definitely connect, collect, validate, orchestrate, and uh, do a lot of things in the supply chain. This is fantastic. Um, just to give you a small example, in the past, we were talking about the data preservation. You know, we have data, and then we would like to preserve some case studies or some information, some data for the future generations, you know. Um, today, this way of looking disappeared because we have millions of data and preserving the data is almost, pre uh, almost impossible. So what we are saying today because of the cost of the storage is not very expensive, we keep all what we have until the next generations, 100 years. And then we have the algorithm, data analytics, etc., to go deep and analyze in real time and understand what we have. So we shifted completely from preserving the minimum information or minimum knowledge for the future generation uh, to be able to understand it to something which is big because of the big data. So we are not able any, uh, uh, anyhow to uh, preserve uh, the information or at, at least to, uh, how you say, to, to, to make it uh, understandable. So we keep it as it is for the future and then we have some tools to uh, analyze it. So this is just one of the examples. So uh, we have these tools, which is very important, but in the same time, they're creating problems because of the uh, amount of data that you have in the supply chain. Uh, you need absolutely to see or to understand uh, a minimum of things, a minimum of data that you have in the supply chain. So today we are talking about uh, top drivers um, leading to a real customer-centric supply chain. So that was a dream in the past when we talk about supply chain uh, really concentrated on the customer, it was a dream. But today it's possible. However, we have to take care about a lot of things. The first one is, or um, well, let's say, talk about the advantage first. The first one is you can sell directly to the individual cons consumers. Uh, we talked in the, in the past about the uh, mass customization and it was, it was very difficult to handle. So today, this is possible. 
uh, we talk more about personalization. Uh, you need to seize new markets and opportunities, or these new technologies gives you the opportunity really in real time to see uh, or to seize new opportunities uh, and to foster the growth by responding quickly to the changes. Um, as I said, the problem is we have too much data. And because of this uh, data, we have tr to try to understand it. And a lot of works have been done today by the research labs, by the companies, in terms of analytics. Uh, they created a lot of tools to um, try to analyze and understand uh, the data. And just for example, uh, today, uh, this is a survey made by IDC last summer, and 40% uh, of the uh, partners of uh, the supply chain, of one of the supply chain that they uh, analyzed, say that uh, uh, there is a real lack uh, of deep insight into the customers and consumers' uh, data. So they wanted to understand, actually, they have a lot of data about the consumers and the customers, but they don't have really uh, the insight, they don't have uh, really, or they don't understand exactly what is happening. And 60% of them are saying that this is because of the complexity of the technology today. Uh, they are not able to handle, mainly SMEs, they are not able to handle the uh, technology today. So, uh, as you see, analytics is becoming central, uh, and the ability to both analyze the data and quickly leverage on it uh, is becoming something very important. So there are a lot of algorithms and approaches that have been uh, created. We call this uh, big data or deep learning, etc. Uh, and this will really seriously distinguish between the good supply chain and the less good supply chain tomorrow. Because you know, if you are able to leverage or to understand quickly the needs of the supply chain in dynamic way, then you can react quickly and then definitely you enhance your supply chain. Um, analytics is becoming critical to the digital enabled supply chain. And why? Because we cannot talk about improving you know, the supply chain without tools to measure the information. Okay? And we cannot measure the information if we don't really understand and we don't know really what we have. So understanding the data is becoming something very important. Um, okay, uh, the analytics will help you to make data-driven decisions, to maintain the global intelligence in the supply chain, to get to the market faster, to increase the flexibility, and to focus, of course, on the innovation. Uh, because when you have the data, you can use it in different ways, and definitely, you can innovate better. Um, just small uh, ideas, or uh, I mean, uh, these are the two main, let's say, uh, applications of the uh, analytics. Um, for example, you have the detection and the prediction. So detection, this is an example on the right, for example, to delineate the individual plants with problems. So you have plants and you would like to see uh, what is happening in the plants. So this, we call it the uh, analytics for detection. We use, of course, uh, laser scanning, we use uh, hyperspectral imaging, etc., and then we analyze them. And we see in the time what is happening during the growth of the, uh, what you have in, in the plants. Uh, this is an example of what we call the deep learning. Uh, we use actually something called neural networks. Uh, as you see here on, 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 the, on the left, you have, for example, uh, we would like to make the detection of a flower, the kind of flower. So you can see on the left the flower. So on the top, it's the natural way to detect it as a human. Uh, so we, we have the image, then we receive the information through the brain, and then we make an interpretation and decision very easily. So for the human, it's very easy. I know, I don't know, I compare, etc. But, yes, okay. Uh, and on the bottom, so you see these uh, new techniques, the neural networks. So in general, what we do, we use feature. So we extract from the image some features that we put manually. For example, we use 10, 15 features. Uh, we say that a flower looks like this because the color, uh, the shape, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have some features and then we make this feature extraction automatically from the data that we have. And then we classify this data and then we say that, okay, it's probably um, this kind of flower. For example, here it's the belly spring, et cetera, et cetera. So as you see on the, on, on the, on the bottom, kind of handcrafted features. And then 
we try to make the algorithm learning these features and then automatically he tries to uh, detect these features. And then we have the probability saying that, ah, it is this flower or that flower, etc. cetera. Um, we have different models. I will not go deep and I have not have time. Uh, so we, we talk about wide model, deep models, uh, wide and deep models, etc. So every two days we have a model. Um, the second application is the prediction. Um, for example, for the weather monitoring or the agronomic modeling, you would like to monitor the growing of the trees, okay? So it's not a detection, it's a prediction, uh, etc. So here, uh, last year I talked in deep about this application that we are doing with Chiang Mai University, for example, about the long uh, growing process. We would like to understand from the experts and the data that we are capturing how the long is growing depending on the different features which are related to the weather, which are related to uh, a lot of things <coughs> in, in the tree itself. So this is one of the applications. Uh, in conclusion, uh, when we talk about analytics for supply chain, actually it's exactly like we talk about uh, business intelligence. So we need, first of all, before deploying a system of analytics, we need definitely to understand the business. Uh, and understanding your data, understanding the business in which you are is very important. Then, of course, comes the other steps of I, I need algorithms to explore this data, to prepare it, uh, to model it, to learn it, etc., before I evaluate my results. So today, I think we are in the middle of this of this uh, of the way. Uh, it's still not very stable, 100%. Uh, it's still depending on the features that you input uh, manually. So it's still uh, not, uh, let's say, very very successful. Uh, in most of the application, it's okay, but uh, there is a lot of work to do. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed for your uh, different uh, view on on the issue of um, uh, supply chain uh, improvement in uh, through AI and uh, of. Uh, uh, digitalization of halal uh, supply chain. Um, I did not tell you from the, the start that we have 15 minutes each for uh, each presentation and then we will try to get the answer by the end of the, the, the session. Thank you very much. Now I would like to uh, invite Dr. Malik for uh, his uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. The floor is yours. Um, good morning. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, I'd like to hear to bring another perspective in, in our tradition of halal and our approach to halal. So uh, my previous uh, speaker here, uh, Professor Buras, was introducing the importance of data. But data can be important and at the same time can lead us to dire situations. I'm putting here a bit of my cybersecurity hat, but I'll also bring back the technology part. Uh, but both, of course, are intrinsically connected. So one key word here is about trust. So it's fine to establish processes to create opportunities for halal and to uh, ensure that we have proper prediction mechanism that guarantees that, but how do we ensure trust that exists? Of course, you know about some technology that exists for that, but I want to bring to perspective different technologies here. So, but let's, let's step back a bit. Last year when I came here, it was my first experience with the uh, Thailand Halal Assembly. It's an amazing experience here. Uh, I was bringing a bit the, the, some of my background work on digital innovation, how core components of technology are transforming industries. Um, so we heard about supply chain here today, and there are key components of the supply chain that are relying heavily on those core technologies nowadays. This is work done, started six years ago and developing across multiple use cases. So those core component technology have been disrupting industries. So that's very fundamental to understand because they're pervasive. So uh, th that means that they're uh, invading our spaces in terms of production, but also in the, our private lives. So this is just a summary reminding of what we talked about last year, and some of you were not here last year, but uh, I think it's, it's interesting to put the perspective back uh, in our minds. So. Um, all these core technologies have transformed the way we do logistics. We uh, eventually access media, we uh, uh, access retail, we uh, pay our uh, bills or access some products and services. So the fundamental part, fundamental part, sorry, of all these developments in this cyberspace and in the digital space 
are heavily relying on trust. Today, you go online, you check if you have your small uh, log to, to ensure that the page is encrypted, so to ensure that your data they will fill into your pages will be secured properly. But hey, there are still some risks here because you cannot uh, uh, protect yourself sometimes by intermediary attacks, so uh, many middle attacks. But I'm going to go there later on. So first of all, in Islam, we have also some of the key principles that we follow as Muslims to ensure that we uh, um, are in line with our principles and we um, basically follow best practices for life. So, and there are definitely a very important emphasis on building trust through sincerity. In our case here, going to the cyberspace and online, digital trust is a fun fundamental component of enabling trust in our new modernized digital world. My colleague before was emphasizing on the importance of data and the importance of digital transformation. Yes, this is currently happening. I'm currently working, for example, in the central bank, and we're seeing a complete transformation of our banking industries. So they are adopting new technologies, artificial intelligence, algorithm, machine learning, deep learning, across different operations within the back office operations of a bank. So that disruptive element brings a notion of, of uh, efficiency, but also uh, uh, questions the trust that we put behind the technology itself. So enabling digital trust is fundamental for enabling a proper supply chain as well to function with all the components. So who am I dealing with? And I'm sure or certified that the product I'm getting is completely in line with our principles. So um, trust is being repeated many times in Quran and Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Mu'minun. Uh, we have a couple of uh, reminders to us that uh, trust is ingrained in our hearts, in our lives. And we have to uh, uh, ensure that it's permanent with our uh, duties, within our duties. When we deal with people, when we transact, or when we uh, simply um, operate um, in our daily lives. So when it comes to trust online, there are two components we, we've dealt with across the years. 20, 30 years ago, we approached the industry uh, to prepare for a better and more secure online uh, presence to ensure that people trust the identity of the people behind. So that's what I call here proof of identity. And proof of identity relies heavily on one particular encryption, cryptographic uh, method. So the other uh, proof of work that has been created thanks to uh, de deployment of blockchain is another component of trust. So the, the uh, two components I'm bringing here are put on the side uh, in perspective of how to create a fully trusted environment that could affect the way we deal in our supply chain. So just as a reminder for non-technical people, so the core technology relying that those two um, uh, principles are relying on are based on asymmetric encryption. So asymmetric encryption means my two friends here, Bang Chan and Sana, are exchanging information. They want to exchange information securely. So this information is, uh, first of all, uh, depending on the way they will exchange it. So in this case, they will ask an authority, either through a software or a, an entity, to produce pairs of keys. So those keys will be generated for them. They will keep private keys for signing uh, the, uh, and encrypting the uh, information partly, and, and signing it mainly, sorry, for integrity, and exchange the public keys that will enable each other to understand each other and to be able to read the information of each other. So that's in a nutshell how asymmetric encryption works. There are underlying components like more detailed algorithm I'm not going to go through now uh, that definitely supports this process. So when it comes to uh, uh, proof of identity, we've created something called public infrastructure. Public infrastructure, uh, I myself run a program called Lux Trust in Luxembourg, and today it's a quite successful company operating the whole digital identity and the whole uh, secure um, authentication mechanism for core services within Luxembourg City and the whole country, actually. So the PKI ecosystem relies on different components. We have a registration authority where people will address themselves and register themselves to get access to the uh, mechanism to, for digital trust. There is a central authority, which is a certificate authority, will produce those certificates, digital certificates. There's a central repository, a directory, and a validation authority, and all these Components work together to ensure that when you authenticate online with your private keys, this is really you doing it, not another entity. So 
other services such as timestamping have become more and more interesting because they create a proof of an evidence of a moment of time where uh, things have been created, where a solution has been proposed or a, a document has been uh, created, let's say a, a patent has been registered at a particular time. So these components have become very crucial to societies for IP protection or for um, uh, ensuring, again, that someone is really accessing his own personal data. So ensuring privacy is something that a PKI provides. So the mechanism go through, uh, my friend Bangchan is back here and he's registering, getting access to his certificates through the CA provided by the, those, those entities like Luxtrust and Luxembourg, for example, where uh, the uh, policies, certificate policy will determine for which purpose these certificates will be issued. So the whole cycle of trust here is uh, maintained through a central authority. And that's a key word here in our, in our discussion now. So uh, we have also possibilities to have services like escrow to protect the private keys, but I would rather keep my private keys with me and being the only one to uh, access it. And eventually, uh, after that, my friend can go online and, and uh, authenticate to different services or eventually encrypt some information uh, through something he owns and something he, uh, he's, uh, he's using in, uh, in his hands. So eventually, if the certificates get expired, uh, there will be, it will be checked real time normally with a, a certification re revocation list. This whole infrastructure is pretty heavy and expensive to maintain in the end because of the resources you need. But this one ensures authenticity of the identity of the person. So this creates the trust that a person behind a computer generating information, pushing information, is the right person because of the registration system. So the PKI ecosystem usually um, is used across companies, is used for systems to encrypt between, between uh, yeah, each other to create secure channels, but also uh, for individuals to authenticate. Uh, everyone here now has an electronic passport, for example, which contains a digital certificate as well. So with working with I ICIO, for example, Luxembourg, we could enable our central uh, certificate authority to uh, go to be used for digital electronic passports. Um, simply by adding a few more fields in the certificates. So uh, to have a natural person enabled certificate, you have to go through some criteria as well. So those um, two components, main components that are used for PKI mostly now, especially with the deployment of encryption technologies and, and, and um, uh, trust-based technologies such as blockchain, so are really heavily relying on signing and encryption. So on the other hand, we have come up a couple of years ago with blockchain and everybody here I'm sure is very familiar with Bitcoin, the most common cryptocurrency, relying on that technology. So blockchain creates a set of block of data and uh, uses also heavily asymmetric encryption to sign, to generate a hash. The hash value is then taken back into, into um, different blocks sequentially and ensuring immutability. So the blockchain purpose is to provide an unchangeable, irrefutable, distributed records of transactions. So I have my digital ledger ensuring that a, a transaction of an object has been going from step, step by step to place, uh, but is recorded somewhere where nobody can touch it, except if. And the except if is the risk where we, we want to focus and eliminate gradually. Um, you can verify that a specific transaction happened and wasn't altered. Integrity is very strong thanks to the cryptographic mechanism. So the asymmetric encryption, the hashing method used ensures that there's no modification of the chain. So the integrity check of blockchain explains why it is used for cryptocurrencies. In monetary policies, we don't want to have anything that would destabilize a nation's economy, for example. That's why cryptocurrencies are so difficult for central bankers. And I can relate a lot about that. Um, system doesn't allow anyone to alter or delete transactions. So we understand that immutability or immutability is very important. So, but blockchain currently provides transparency resource reduction as well in some aspects, it can be good or bad. Eliminate errors, ensures integrity, that's very important for trust, and uh, durability as well. The main aspect of blockchain that's very interesting is the resiliency aspect because it relies on multiple nodes. It's not one central authority that we have on PKI, which is done for another purpose, that uh, you have in blockchain. So blockchain is relying on multiple validation nodes. So. This is how blockchain works. A uh, user generates a block, the genesis blocks initially, uh, and the block, the block are broadcast to peers, whether in permissioned version or a public version. 
It's the same case. The only difference is that permission version. You have you authorize who wants to be who will be part of the of your blockchain, and the participants validate the block. The block is added to the chain, and the chain consists into um, data in, in each block that has the initial signature that is combined to the, the the next block is combining the initial signature plus its own signature, etc., etc., etc. So that construction here, blockchain is fairly interesting to provide to ensure that deliverables have been accurate along the way. So that's why it's very strong, as my colleague talked about the supply chain logistics. Blockchain is very, very valuable for uh, logistics and ensuring trust from end to end in terms of production itself. So, but there are still a couple of risks around that. So we've studied some risks around PKI, for example, in public infrastructure, People have become, you know, very, very smart in a way to intercept certificates. So the man in middle attack is very, very famous and commonly known. There are some mitigation measures, of course, around that. Um, the um, self-signed root certificates can be an issue as well, especially if there's impersonation at the top level of the uh, certificate hierarchy. Um, there are other technical issues which are related more to the infrastructure. If the security of the infrastructure is compromised, of course, there's a risk that the whole chain of distribution of this digital identity could be compromised as well. So replicating a certificate of an identity could be an issue. So um, the verification of the systems of infrastructure are critical. Then blockchain, it could be part of what we call the smart contracts. When we establish our blockchain, we define what we want to uh, enforce on the other, on the other hand, um, sorry, on the other, in the other end of the, of the chain. Uh, but we also have confidentiality issue because the information will, be, will have necessarily to be known to the participating nodes in your blockchain. Permissioned, at least you have a trusted party, but still, and you need also to add, thank you, you need also to add uh, some proficient skill set around cryptography to really understand uh, blockchain. Um, and of course, can have strategic impact, depending on how pervasive it can be in a, in a wide-scale development. But if we think about those two components, we have digital identity and digital uh, uh, identity, and digital um, proof of, uh, of work, two different types of trust that can eventually be combined to create new opportunities. So if we think about that, proof of identity and proof of work have to be related. In the case, for example, of production of halal products, so I have the evidence that a product has not been altered and is still respecting our halal principles. But what about the, uh, the, the beginning of the chain? Who is issuing these products? Do I trust the uh, entity itself? Am I sure that has not been an intermediary jumping into the chain and maybe eventually you know, presenting himself as part of that blockchain eventually? So there are a lot of questions about how we validate the nodes to ensure that trust, but also who really is behind a system that could be e either way a blockchain. So there's some talks about creating, for example, a public identity network that will rely on blockchain. So combining PKI called DPKI or distributed PKI to leverage on blockchain to store identity credentials in a blockchain and to ensure that the same mechanism that is used in PKI is still usable, which means we can trust and identify the people who have been registered within this public identity network, for example. So that's a way to combine those two technologies. But if I could use leverage a technology like this to ensure that my whole supply is also fully trusted from the person I'm dealing with and the product I'm receiving, then I have a complete ecosystem of trust, a real, true digital trust from end to end. So last but not least, uh, I, will very, I will conclude on this one. So in the world of artificial intelligence, um, we may want to think about how we want to make it pervasive, which means how these core technologies of related to proof of identity and proof of work or digital trust could be embedded into uh, the future developments. So currently we see a lot of cyber threats, cyber attacks that are mostly generated by humans, but in the future we may have more and more automation within the malicious world. So people who are trying to disrupt a chain of production or people who are also trying to steal identity to present themselves as trusted parties. So those technologies that we're talking about could be definitely worked out to be combined at lower, lower level in uh, core technologies. And I would like here to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Malik, for uh, your uh, main issue of how to create 
digital trust and in uh, cyber security of uh, blockchain. And the next speaker will be uh, Mr. Abdullah Kwang Yu Han, um, Managing Director of Halal uh, Chain Foundation, and of course, co founder. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Abdullah. And today, my speech and the topics is about uh, how Gitamir blockchain supports the ecosystem of Islamic economy in general. Uh, firstly, because uh, the other panelists does describe about blockchain. Uh, really? Okay. okay. So uh, actually, I, I want to uh, try to uh, describe blockchain from five different layers. Uh, especially about, uh, we all know that blockchain is a distributed ledger that is going to create a trust whereby we don't have to involve third party. And uh, from my point of view that uh, blockchain, especially public blockchain, is a tokenization incentive mechanism that is going to incentivize the participation of everyone. And also in the future, the blockchain as a uh, infrastructure, distributed infrastructure, that is going to play a very vital role and essential role uh, in terms of uh, financial applications. And blockchain is a technology that is very important and very relevant to the halal economy. And I'm trying to explore how to push and boost adoption of blockchain technologies in halal economy from different perspectives. And uh, whereby I uh, here would like to say that uh, blockchain, especially public blockchain, uh, based on POW consensus, uh, it is very neutral, and uh, the underlying philosophy of blockchain, which advocate for trust, transparency, is uh, absolutely in line with some of the values, uh, which is uh, from uh, El Quran. Uh, uh, so uh, we don't see any conflicts between the Islamic econom economics uh, and the blockchain philosophy, and. Uh, here is that, uh, firstly, actually, I want to talk about two things today. Firstly, about Gitamir blockchain, and secondly, is about Halal chain. Uh, here is like, uh, actually, Halal chain is a solution we developed in 2017. Uh, our intention is to develop uh, a consortium chain solution uh, whereby to enhance transparency, visibility, and traceability, uh, especially for the, uh, uh, especially in the area that lacks trust, I want to give a chance for China in particular, because China, whereby mostly are minorities, we all have this problem that a lot of like restaurants, they will mention they are halali, but actually they're not, or they are not fully halali. So how to be self-evident, how to build up trust between the consumers and the suppliers. So there's a gap in between. So we would like to find out a solution for this one. Uh, and secondly, uh, here is, uh, uh, about uh, uh, about from a traceability system is also a token system uh, and also uh, uh, a, a utility token system. So here is a, like uh, uh, we would like to say about the uh, Gitamir network. Um, uh, as we know that most of the applications in the Islamic economy space uh, is based on the use cases, right? Uh, so Gitamir is uh, actually a blockchain, first blockchain that is dedicated to serve ethical finance uh, and Islamic economy, which is try to enhance uh, the uh, connections of the uh, every verticals of Islamic uh, uh, perspective, and uh, 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 bas basically it adopts a uh, structure of. Uh, uh, POW consensus, POW consensus, where is the proof of work? And there are many consensus in, in uh, public blockchain, POW, and also proof of stake, uh, proof of authority, uh, and uh, which we trust that uh, POW is very inclusive and accessible to every node, which gives a chance for participation for everyone. Uh, but uh, the current uh, blockchain system, especially like Bitcoin network, Ethereum, uh, have a problem in terms of uh, 
massive adoption, which there is no scalability. Like Bitcoin, we can only pro provide a transaction like, uh, uh, like uh, seven times per second, which means like the whole Bitcoin network uh, globally can only support 20,000 people for use. And Ethereum uh, uh, is, uh, is 50, between 50 and 100. Likewise, right now, I used to send uh, like a small transaction, which is very small Ethereum. It takes like uh, two weeks for me to arrive. So let us assume we, we uh, utilize a blockchain system, payment system in a halal restaurant. And it takes like, um, uh, especially very small transactions, it takes a long period for processing, which is not uh, usable and viable in terms of the real adoptions. So we adopt a uh, DAG structure, a block, uh, blockchain and block DAG. Blockchain is like, uh, is I'm a restaurant and uh, we have to uh, attain only one customer, one by one. We confirm one blocks and when we include another one. And block DAG is that we can co currently process all the transactions. So which comes with uh, uh, scalability uh, for the real use case adoptions. And today, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, today for Islamic economy, we can say uh, there's uh, uh, many like challenges. Uh, in the halal economy, we can see there's no uh, inaccurate and unauthentic data of halal product. Uh, and also in Islamic uh, capital market, there's, uh, and, uh, there's no too much innovation. Uh, most of the banks are focused on Murabah. And most importantly, actually, Islamic economy uh, fundamentally uh, and also in practice are not connected uh, either in halal economy and the Islamic uh, finance they are not connected so how to create a convergence uh, in terms of uh, Islamic financial system and also halal economy and how uh, likewise right uh, you can say the ecosystem of Islamic economy is not complete uh, as a circle uh, most of the Islamic banks support Murabah all like investment in the real estate in the Western countries, right, focused on the fixed income. Uh, and uh, uh, while uh, the uh, halal food manufacturers and the other industry players are using conventional banking, so how to create a convergence in the two sections to come up to come out with innovations? Uh, this is like, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, Harlali market review, uh, which uh, de describe a lot of potentials, which other panelists has already described. Uh, here is like uh, one of the solutions uh, we describe uh, on the hyperledger. Actually, we developed this uh, solution like two years ago. Uh, we uh, received like uh, 500 uh, manufacturers uh, application from China. Uh, in terms of how to adopt this like uh, blockchain traceability solutions uh, from the manufacturers uh, to the storage to the consumers uh, and uh, then we utilize uh, 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 then we utilize a smart contract uh, for the enforcement uh, so i uh, I have to say that uh, uh, there are two problems you know uh, two problems firstly in terms of the whole supply chain traceability and the visibility, everything. Uh, blockchain is, can only play one layer uh, in terms of the whole system because we still need Internet of uh, Things to collect uh, to collect data in a smart way. Uh, like uh, in terms of how, uh, in a manufacturer, how do they slaughter? How do they slaughter like animals in a proper manner? But this data needed to be collected and uploaded to blockchain. All right. So how to uh, collect this data. We still need internet of facilities. This is the first one. So we need the other, the integration of the other technologies. This is the uh, first one. Secondly, that the node cannot be very long. Let me say uh, the, uh, a chicken manufacturer in Brazil and the importer in Saudi Arabia. This chain is very long. How do we come up with this coordination from multi nodes? from uh, different customs, from different regulators. Uh, so you want to provide the whole supply chain traceability uh, and provide the whole transparency. It comes a lot of regulation challenges for multi-regulators uh, to coordinate with each other. If you are from private sectors, uh, it's almost impossible for you to 
coordinate all these regulators uh, from in such a long supply chain? This is the second uh, question. Apart from that, is that we have to make sure that is blockchain uh, efficient technology? And what is the real benefit if I adopt a blockchain technology as a manufacturer? Does that boost my consume, consume? Does that lift my business? Uh, we cannot just push adoption for the sake of adoption. So here uh, I, I can describe that in two, uh, we can do two steps, all right? First steps, maybe you can do proof of authority, like as a Halali standard organization, my certificate, we should tokenize this certificate first, because like, like was in China and in the art market, uh, let me say there's a manufacturer, he does not have a certificate of Halal food manufacturer, but he will put a label on top of it. And uh, this is really uh, bring the confusions to the consumers. And for this certificate, what we can do is, we can put the certificate of authority, a Halal standard organization authority on blockchain. And this can easily be verified and uh, can be checked, can be traced, pro provide the first step trust. And instead of to upload everything from multi-node uh, to blockchain, uh, it's not very practical at this very moment. This is the first one. Secondly, that uh, the current blockchain system is not a scalable and it's not a big infrastructure that accommodates everything. Uh, likewise, right now, the only data that is, uh, that is popular on blockchain is transaction data, not the data of the industry itself. Because I don't, blockchain, uh, especially public blockchain as a distributed technology, uh, te uh, techn uh, technical infrastructure is not s scalable and efficient to hold all the data. That is too big for a blockchain system to accommodate everything. So hereby, uh, my suggestion is, because I developed this uh, uh, demo uh, that is in place already, uh, we, we want to push it to the industry adoption. We can, uh, we can divide it into phase one and phase two. Phase one is proof of authority. Phase two is pr proof of work in a consortium chain. Here is, we describe all this like, uh, uh, like a lot of advantages uh, about like uh, the traceability uh, based on hyperledger system, which is uh, we can put it on our own Gitmir blockchain. Uh, actually, uh, we 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 get like one or two pilot project uh, from uh, Chinese manufacturers uh, 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 in China, and uh, is still at the pilot stage. We want to push it for the massive adoption. We are expecting the uh, the support from Halal economy industrial stakeholders to push the adoption of blockchain. And here is that. Uh, we also explore uh, the other use cases uh, of uh, Gitmir blockchain in the Islamic economy, uh, such as like uh, 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 such as like uh, finan uh, financial uh, inclusion. Uh, let me say we can put a blockchain wallet and put a stable coin, and this stable coin can be used for financial inclusion. And uh, uh, actually, a few days ago, I was back in China to discuss uh, this financial inclusion uh, with. Um, uh, with uh, one of the Chinese big bankers uh, from Tencent, and we mentioned that there's a huge smartphone penetration for the young people in the Muslim world, and uh, they have a strong affiliation with cryptocurrency and the blockchain uh, use cases. We can introduce a smartphone uh, uh, blockchain wallet to enhance financial inclusion. Uh, this is also one of the use cases we can, uh, we can, we can try to, uh, to, to, to make it happen. Apart from that one, in terms of the card, in terms of Islamic uh, Tekafo insurance, uh, we can use a smart contractor to make it happen. Uh, and also like for asset tokenization for Skook, there's a lot of like use cases uh, for uh, in the Islamic economy. What we are trying to say and propose is to push a distributed underlining infrastructure that is going to be maintained by everyone from the, from the underlying foundation, and on top of this underlying distributed foundation, we can explore the use cases of Islamic uh, economies from different, uh, from different verticals, which is going to push and come out of a dynamic and healthy ecosystem uh, of Islamic economy based on blockchain. This is the wallet, which is a product that is working right now. Uh, here, I just have one minute. I, actually, I want to give some recommendations. Uh, thank you. 
uh, that uh, recommendations how to push the ecosystem of, of Islamic economy of blockchain. Uh, for supply chain traceability, we can, we can divide it into two stages, proof of authority and proof of work. And apart from that, for the halal industry, especially for the modest fashion and for the cosmetics, we can develop a utility token that is going to incentivize uh, the participation of the consumers, to participate to incentivize the consumers and manufacturers and distributors together through a utility token system. And also we can utilize the uh, security token offer and ICO to raise money for further raising in terms of fintech. Uh, in the Islamic finance uh, perspective, we can focus on the asset tokenization and uh, stable coin based blockchain um, uh, system. So for all these like uh, verticals I mentioned, if we push uh, through the everybody, uh, we can develop a very dynamic, healthy, and prosperous Islamic uh, eco uh, ecosystem based on blockchain. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Abdullah, uh, for your uh, important topic on uh, yes. a Keith me the case of Keith me uh, company and uh, certification of uh, blockchain uh, technology uh, in the uh, halal economy. Uh, okay, now I would like to. <laughs> I think you. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Paradon for the last presentation for. This section. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I know that it, there's a 15 minute between my presentation and lunch. Okay, I make it short and briefly, and I hope you get uh, a point of uh, what we're trying to do uh, to apply the blockchain technology in uh, Thailand Halal certification. Uh, it's my outline. So firstly, I would like to talk about why we need blockchain in halal economy. So we're going to talk about the future of halal economy. Uh, then, then the second is about the how uh, we can adopt the, how we can make use of the blockchain, uh, which I will talk about the digitalized the Thailand halal uh, certification and uh, how plus uh, data, data integration. And lastly, uh, how to, how we can adopt the idea of uh, the, te the blockchain technology into uh, Halan certification. So I'm talking about the Halan certification by using the blockchain, which uh, will be uh, a practical work that we are doing now, okay? Uh, before I'm going to the blockchain, I'm going to tell something about what could be the future. It's just my imagination. But I'm quite sure, and in, by my gut feeling, you, we're going to face this in, in the near future. About the halal future food. We are talking about, uh, now we are talking about the slaughtering, uh, cows, chicken, whatever. How about in the future? Not in the future. Now there are many startups in Silicon Valley, in Europe, talking about the input, uh, uh, cultivate meat, that we are growing meat from the lab. And the cows and chicken didn't die didn't been slaughtered. Uh, which is we take some cells from uh, animal, from cows, and we cultivate it in the lab, and we're going to use it as a hamburger. Is that allowed? So that is a question, uh, another question for us, for the standard. And anyway, uh, as a consumer, how can we know that the burger that we are consuming, the product that, that we are uh, eating, is it from the real meat or, or or impossible meat, this kind of things. So you can, actually you can find this in some airport in, in, in Singapore, you, even you can find this. Or even a chicken, now, now this is from, I captured from the website of the, of the startups in, in, in Silicon Valley, they do sell the barbecue from the chicken and the, the chicken is still running there, it, it didn't die, okay. Uh, that's why we need the data for, for to collect and, 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 and to make sure and give us trust that what we are consuming. Another way of talking about the blockchain is that uh, we are now less and less going to the supermarket. Uh, we are quite boring about that, going to the same route and talk, bringing the same product and pay at the same cashier. 
But in the future, not in the, I'm not going to talk about the future. Now, even in many countries in the United States, now they're talking about uh, uh, voice command, voice shopping. You can tell Alexa, now you can buy it very cheap in, on Amazon. And you can tell Amazon that, okay, I would like to have a cereal, uh, uh, two package, extra large, for example, family size, and then the cereal can be delivered to your house by the end of the day. So what about, we are talking about, uh, I would like to get a halal cereal. And then when you talk about halal cereal, how Alexa or even the AI bot know that the, this cereal is halal or is really halal. And how to make sure that where is the database that they can, could, could get. Maybe they check from the halal certification or they check from the halal verification from Amazon database or maybe the blockchain uh, system. So we're going to have to provide them, provide the knowledge for the robot, for the AI, whatever, that this is halal. Uh, then we have to do something and collect the data and because in the future we might not see the product or the package anymore. And crypto, we talk about the block, uh, the Bitcoin, about the Ethereum, about I don't know, what, whatever. Even now, we have many uh, Islamic uh, crypto exchange stock market or crypto uh, halal coin, whatever. There's many effort to do this. And, and how can we make sure that uh, the crypto or the currency that we are using is, the, is a, a Sharia compliance, okay? And peer-to-peer, -peer, this is something that may, many countries is working on. Even Thailand, we have a uh, just government just launching the law of peer-to-peer. -peer. We don't have to go to the bank and we don't have to bother with about the interest rate anymore because it's going to rent lending from your neighbor, from your friends, and it's not the interest rate. It's just what you promise to return. You can take 100 baht and you promise your friend that you're going to return 110 baht after two weeks because you need that to pay uh, for something. It's peer-to-peer -peer lending, but Again, the question is how you can make sure this is uh, the the peer to peer or the uh, or the platform that you are using is Sharia compliance, and 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 then probably the blockchain is something that could answer the, this question. Anyway, I searched from the internet. There's 136 uh, fintech company around the world. I think probably they have more than this, but it is just do it by the Islamic uh, finance landscape. Okay, just to give you some idea. And about in, in the future, we're going to have a variable device, variable uh, fashion. You have you see Nike doing something great for uh, women uh, fashion. And now we got to talk about the smart, smart shirt, smart textiles. And for sure, in the future, your data will be stored in the cloud, in the blockchain. And then uh, what are we going to do about that? And even the halal logistic and you see the drone bring the product to your house, okay? Then uh, that is why we need uh, to think about the blockchain and about the trust, about the security and privacy of your data. Uh, blockchain is uh, one of the hot issues that we are talking about this. And the second point of view that I'm talking about, uh, to, to do this, we, do, we have to digitalize. Uh, what we are going to do, uh, the halal certification, we, we, we all know that we are using the paper to uh, we go to the factory, we, we do the document and, and signature and give them, and then they get the certifi uh, paper certification. And this is the effort that uh, uh, Halan Science Center doing, trying to propose the uh, system protocol for Halan Electronic Resource Exchange. I have presented this uh, uh, last year and a uh, year before. Uh, so this is just an, 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 an overview. You, uh, I, I might not go into the details. But uh, just to uh, let you know that any, anyway, before going to the blockchain or even high technology, the first thing is to digitalize and put the data on, on the system. That's just most important thing. Uh, everything starts with the data. So what we what we're trying to do is we're trying to put all the data from the factory, from the Islamic committee that go uh, uh, as a CB and AB, and auditor that go to do the check uh, audit in your factory, and and a psychot which is AB of the of the uh, halal certification, 
and even from the lab, from the Halal lab, such as uh, Halal Science Center, we have to digitalize this kind of uh, process before we think a much further. I, I'm not going to say that we uh, have success on this, but, but we are in the process and, and we are quite doing well. And that's why we propose a lot of uh, platform that's trying to help the consumer keep track of the, the Halal uh, certification process. Uh, payment online and check of the Halal certification platform. Even for the auditor, we provide a tablet application for for the in, instead of bringing the document to the factory. So you probably should take the tablet and and do the certification. Uh, we have uh, H4E, which is uh, uh, E number that uh, Dr. Vinay have presented this morning. Trying to digitalize everything is it even from the database from the Halal Science Center. Uh, into into the system and and uh, this is so, just some initiative that we if if we success on this we can track the halal certification online so we have a halal scan so this is just the uh, uh, an effort and then we this is one way to get the data from the internet uh, from the plat to the platform another way is trying to get the data from 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 the industrial itself this is uh, another way that we are doing, we're trying to uh, promote the How Plus platform that uh, the main target is the, is the industry. So we give them the news, the knowledge, and facilitate them for the business matching. Uh, and they will get the benefit and buying, trying to put more data on the platform. They're going to level up into from the member into the bronze to silver and gold. You see at the, at the bottom of the page, uh, if you are the member, you just provide the user data. And if you're going to be the bronze uh, member, so you, so you share us, share with us the user data and company data. And then when you provide more the uh, product data and halal certification, you become a silver. And if, if you're going to be the, the, the uh, gold member, it means the ingredient that you use in, in each product is was on the platform. So this is one way to collect the data, not from the CB itself, but also from the industry that uh, provides us the data. This is the idea that we are uh, working on. So as I told you, if the, uh, along the, the data input, data integration, when you are the civil le level, so it's, it's mean that you are halal uh, manufacturer. You be, because you provide us the Halan uh, certification number and you take a photo of your Halan certification, this kind of things. Uh, at this level, uh, we adopt the idea of the blockchain in, into the silver level and gold level. But I'm going to explain to you a little bit about the silver level. So this is just uh, a mock-up. Uh, it's not a real one that we implement, but it's good to give you some idea of how we uh, 